Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Yes. 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 And tonight... Uh, Dan Snow tastes weird food from George and Britain. So that's... I looked it up. That's... That's uh, 1738. Was he born in... seven? No. Wow. Wait, what? 62s. He reigned for 82 years. No way. 62 years. Okay, Jesus, I'm slow. Hey, Dan. Oh. Oh. Hi, I'm the extremely eligible Dan Snow with a thousand a year to my name. And tonight, I'm a guest at a Georgian dinner party. Let's see what's on the menu. There's a variety of cold cuts and meat pies, plus a sumptuous platter of white soup, a staple of the period. There's a delightful bowl of sweetbreads, or as you and I would call them, offal. Stuffing? And to finish, oh. a bite of juicy pineapple fresh from the tropics. Those grapes look good. First things first, I want to wash all this stuff down. I'm going to need a little lubrication. Some wine. Nice. Now, the Georgians drank all sorts of wine. White wine, claret, which means wines from the Bordeaux area of France. Wine is very important in a Georgian dinner party. Hey, all dinner parties, let's be honest. In 1825, Mrs. Parks wrote a book in which she talked about the kind of wines you had to serve at a dinner party. She said, the decanted wines placed on the table during dinner are white wines, either Madeira, Sherry, or Bucellus. Those circulated after dinner are Port, Madeira, and claret. She went on to say looking. that claret is I mean, as much as you can tell from a, from a drawing. Never mind. Port, Sorry. Madeira and claret. She went on to say that claret is generally contained in a decanter with a handle and of a peculiar form. It's quite a formal setup. And it wasn't just the wine that was formal. There were even rules about who you could talk to and when. You had to have conversation only with the person on your right or your left, and therefore where the hostess sat her guests was crucial. Now, there were some informal dinners, a bit less rigid. You could talk across the table at those, really let your hair down. And you only drank wine with someone else. You didn't just sit there glugging it by yourself. Never clink glasses, though. A lady or a gentleman would raise a glass to you and you would drink in return. A drink with you, sir. Thank you, sir. A Georgian dinner party was Cold quite coffee. a do. The tables would have been groaning with food. Several courses and different dishes in each course. Guests who sat down would have soup, meat, game, pickles, jam. I'm not trying to be judgy. Ugh! That looks awful. Guests who sat down would have soup, meat, game, pickles, jellies, vegetables, custards, puddings. People's head. Perhaps five dishes. Perhaps 25, depending on the grandeur of the occasion. Now, of course, for a country that was constantly at war with France in the 18th century, French food was the height of fashion. And you had to have a French chef, darling. You gotta you say, those, uh, that fruit looks pretty good. The grapes look good. I can't really tell until you cut open the pineapple. The clementines look good. If those are oranges, then those look insanely good. I think they're French food was the height of fashion. And you had to have a French chef, darling. You can tell a lot about Georgian sensibilities and food from reading Jane Austen. She creates a character in Pride and Prejudice called Mrs. Bennet, who is hyper socially aware. This is what she had to say about the food at one of her neighbor's parties. The soup was 50 times better than what we had at the Lucas's last week. And even Mr. Darcy acknowledged that the partridge were remarkably well done. And I suppose he has two or three French cooks at least. Austin teaches us that dinner parties in the Georgian era were less about making guests feel comfortable and feeding them excellent food. This world is a well-furnished table where guests most promiscuity set we food. And more about the Georgian era were less about making guests feel comfortable and feeding them excellent food, and more about status and one-upmanship. White soup Miss? was to a Georgian do what punch is to a frat house party. 
white soup, was meat stock, egg yolk, ground almonds, cream, occasionally a bit of bacon, and it was served at balls. Let's give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> gamey, it's gamey soup, if you can believe that. It fortifies you though, you could tell you'd be ready for a whole night on the dance floor after that. Jane Austen says that white soup was so important that a ball was virtually impossible without it. One of her characters planning a party says, as for the ball, it's quite a settled thing. And as soon as Nichols has made enough white soup, I shall send round my cards. No white soup, no party. Looks like chowder. Here we go. Oh, big bit of chicken. The thing about these white foods is that like with flour and sugar, they were historically considered, well, status symbols because they were more expensive. They needed refining, processing, and therefore they were lighter and more expensive than their unrefined counterparts. And it's possible that the reason this was like the centerpiece at fashionable parties was because you projected. It seems like it's like, oh, it doesn't matter how good the food is. Does it look good? And does it look wealthy? Or does it look rich style? Doesn't matter if your clothes are comfortable. Do they look good? Do they show your class? Ah, that would drive me insane. An image of wealth. Right, let's move on to the main course. As you can see, it involved a lot of meats. You had pies, you had hams, you had breasts of duck, poultry. Let's check Never this had duck. Here. What have we got here? Venison. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot go wrong with a pie. Delicious. Dancing food. But you also get some vegetables, things like asparagus when it's in season. But meat I love made up a large part of the Georgian diet, even for the middle class. You got venison, game, things that could be hunted and shot. That was another way of showing off to your guests. It suggested that you had a country estate where those things could be procured, or that you'd been gifted them by some royal. It's like cholera. Is that a cholera pie? It says something on there. Something day. Oh, so it was a. The Lancer? Lancet? State where those things can be procured, or that you've been gifted them by some royal aristocratic friend. Ah, uh, yes. I'm getting a bit worried about Georgian gut health, to be honest. But fun place to visit. Now, we come on to the most bizarrely named part of the Georgian diet. The so-called sweetbreads which sounds nice, but in fact, they're offal. They're glands. They're drawn from the stomach. Look, I, I, I don't have any allergies or anything. There, there really are no foods that I won't try. I like vegetables, I like fruit, I like meat, I like grain, I like dairy. Like there, I, I like a, a bunch of every different types of food. But I just, I would do it. I would. I would try it, but I just imagine it being like a rubber band or or something like that. Or maybe if you chop it up, or, or if it's like really hot. I feel like if something is really really hot when you're eating it, I, I it doesn't have to be as good, you know. And they're glands. They're drawn from the stomach. In one Jane Austen book, the anyone ever had this is offered. A delicate fricassee of sweet bread and some asparagus. Well, swallow it. It looks like chicken. It kind of feels a bit like chicken, but it tastes like lard or kidney or something, frankly, pretty disgusting. I think there's something strangely poetic about Jane Austen's characters standing around having polite conversations whilst munching on testicles and ovaries. I mean, if I'm starving, but I mean... I don't know how polite I'd be if I was eating that the whole time. 
So from 1815 or so onwards, you start to see a change in the way the Georgians had their dinner parties, particularly in London, which was the leader of fashion and a more formal place. Dinner parties started to be served a la russe. That means serving food in separate courses, not just one big groaning table. Each course would be taken away and replaced with another. This method became more and more popular later in the Regency era. The Prince Regent, who would become George IV, he loved this food. And he loved a little night out as well. Now, he had a French chef called Carême, who's credited with introducing this idea à la russe. And the upper George class... IV always just makes me think of Gilderoy Lockhart for some reason. I don't know why, from Harry Potter. <laughs> he loved this food. And he loved a little night out as well. Now, he had a French chef called Carême, who's credited with introducing this idea à la russe. And the upper classes always took their lead from the Prince region and what was most fashionable on the continent. So his method caught on amongst the nobility and gentry. From that point onwards, a formal dinner might be two courses followed by dessert. So we're all followers of Karem to the present day. The ultimate status symbol in the Georgian period was oddly a yeah. fruit. Oh. Pineapples could only be grown in the warm tropical weather. But aristocrats here in chilly old Northern Britain decided that they wanted to show off just how much money they had, the staff, the facilities, to actually try and grow these at home. You have a if pineapple. you had a dinner party where you served homegrown pineapples, it meant you were a wealthy guy. In 1764, the Gentleman's Magazine estimated that it cost 150 pounds to build a hothouse, to cover the running costs, to buy the initial plant stock, and all this expense, of course, is not guaranteed to give any return. Now, if you stick that through the Bank of England's inflation calculator, that's roughly equivalent today to £22,000 in order to grow some of these. Pineapples were hot property. Maids who transported them from one house to another could be accosted by thieves. In 1807, there were several court cases for pineapple theft at the Old Bailey in London. The most notorious was Mr. Godding, who was sentenced to seven years transportation to Australia for stealing seven pineapples. I'll spare a thought here for the aspiring middle classes who want to get ahead, but they can't get their mitts on any pineapples. They can't afford to grow them. Well, as so often with capitalism, the market responded. Canny businessmen opened up pineapple rental shops across Britain. Companies of all different kinds cashed on the fruit's popularity. And, and now, the, and then you got inflation. And now the pineapple is not as cool anymore. Right away, boom. Like, oh, you got all the pine. It's, it's, it's fascinating how people work. Um, it's, I feel like every subject, whether it's econ economics or politics or history, it, it, it seems like it's all just a study of psychology and how we're, we're just like, oh my God, those are so rare. He got that. I want one. And then they get it. And now it's like, well, now everyone wants them. And now they're garbage. Or it, uh. You see them engraved and carved into buildings. And the market for pineapple-themed goods exploded. Porcelain makers like Wedgwood produced pineapple-shaped well, everything really. And the beauty of all these more durable pineapples is while the fruit rotted away, the statues and carvings would always remain to remind guests in perpetuity of just how wealthy you were. The elite of Georgian Britain lived in a world of plenty. They'd never had it so good. Certainly not true for many other people in the world at the time. And that spirit of excess was embodied in the king, King George IV, who when he died, was enormously fat and weighed 24 stone. So ungainly that it gave the undertakers a real problem with his corpse. 24 stone, what is that? Thanks for dining with me, folks. If that video has whet your appetite, there are more delicious courses available. Simply click on any of the videos on this Ooh, screen uh... for more. I've seen this. Uh, very good. Love me some Dan Snow. Really interesting. Uh, let me know if you guys have ever had, what is it, tripe or something, and, and if I'm thinking of it wrong, maybe it's really good if it's cooked in the right way. Who knows? Like brisket. All right, love you guys. Hope you're all doing well. I'll see you guys next time.